we're moving very soon. So January 7th, we're headed to Calgary, Canada. Uh, it's a couple of thousand miles away from home. And uh, home is here, uh, just right up the road. I've actually got some people in my church at First Baptist in Lancaster. You say, say it the right way. Uh, I went very quickly when I moved there. I would say Lancaster, you know, five years ago. I was, well, I'm, you know, the new youth pastor at Lancaster. And no, 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 no. You don't say it that way. Not if you don't. Uh, so... Uh, but uh, I'm an Ohio native. I grew up in between Dayton and Cincinnati. And so that's kind of home. That's where my family is. If you've ever heard of Hillcrest Baptist Church in Carlisle, uh, that's where my parents met as teenagers. Uh, so my mom joined the church and my dad said, she's pretty. And <laughs> here I was about seven years later. So uh, that's, uh, that's kind of a, a quick overview of, of what we're doing. But this morning I just want to share with you kind of how God has called us to Calgary. Um, and, and why, and, and hopes that it would be an encouragement to you to be obedient to the Lord when He calls you to do whatever it is He's calling you to do. Um, being attentive to His voice and then being willing to do whatever it takes to follow Him are, are kind of, those are two areas where we struggle. So in the second hour uh, for the worship service, we're going to look at David and, and the Psalms and how he dealt with fear, uh, and what it means to overcome fear and how to do that biblically. Uh, but so that's kind of where the morning is headed. If you have any questions, uh, by any means, don't be afraid to ask. Especially now, you can just kind of, hey, i got a question. What about this? Um, if I don't know the answer, I'll try and find it. But if it's kind of about Calgary, I think at this point, um, if, if it's there, I think I know it. But if you're asking a question I don't know, it's because I'm not there yet. So, uh, But uh, that's kind of where things are and, and, and where things are headed. Uh, so been married. Uh, our 10-year wedding anniversary is January 6th. And we moved January 7th, so happy anniversary, honey. We're moving to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Knocked out of the park on that one. Um, so, yeah, did, did really well there. Uh, we actually went away. Uh, we just got back from we went to Hawking Hills and got a cabin this weekend and celebrated our 10-year wedding anniversary. And we got rid of the kids uh, for the weekend, so uh, that's where my wife is. She's meeting in-laws back in Kentucky to pick up kids this morning and all that. But uh, we had a couple days of quiet before the craziness. So we get home yesterday about 2 o'clock, and you would think, oh, we're celebrating your anniversary. You've got time. You know, it's just the two of you. You've been gone for a few days. You're nice and relaxed. You should probably just, you know, kick on the games and just just chill. No. We started packing. Uh, so <laughs> there's nothing on our walls anymore. All the dishes on top of the cabinets are now off, and there's a big, gigantic pile of boxes that we started putting together. and All those things. Took the weight machine apart. and took it back to the guy who let me borrow it the last few years, all that fun stuff. So um, we've been been doing that. Our Christmas tree, uh, so usually we have like, we, we have some church members that own a tree farm, so uh, we always go there and get a Christmas tree, and we always decorate it and do this big deal. Our Christmas tree this year is the one that normally goes in one of my daughter's rooms. It's about a foot and a half tall and about a yay wide at the base, and it has one ornament. Uh, it's a Hello Kitty ornament left over from last year. <laughs> so we stuck that in the family room so the kids come home to their Christmas tree. So uh, we're like, well, uh, the tree is not the reason for the season, right? So we'll be all right. Uh, but uh, So that's kind of where things are. It's just kind of this craziness right now that uh, tomorrow uh, I'm working a half day at the office and then I'm picking up more boxes from a lady at the mall and then there's some people from church coming over to help us pack. Uh, so everything is just rolling. Um, so... We'll land there in, there in a second, but let me back up for you to just try and lay out what God's been doing and hopes again that it would encourage you to follow what God's doing in your life. Uh, so back in 2006, uh, I graduated college, so I know that dates some of you like Marty, but that's okay. Um, in 2006, I started going to seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. I started working on a Master of Divinity degree. Uh, we got married right after that first semester, and, and so... Uh, that began a process, but one of the first classes I had on campus was Intro to Church Planting. And up until that point, uh, I'm like a fourth generation Southern Baptist, like never grew up outside the church. I was there every time the doors were open. Dad's been a deacon my whole life kind of deal. I mean, just, you know, I've been engaged from the womb. Um, I was the kid in the back asleep during the sermon because children's church didn't exist then kind of thing. I mean, just, you know, I've been around. And so uh, just didn't realize uh, where churches came from. They'd always just been in my world. Um, I've been a part of two churches up to that point. Um, I mean, I just, you know, never thought of it. And so I sat in this class, and for a three-hour lecture, I listened to this guy named J.D. Payne 
talk about church planting and starting new churches and why we need to start new churches and where they come from and the biblical reasons that it's there in scripture and, and all these things I've never really even processed or thought about. And so I, I sat there in that class going, that's it. I want to give my life to that. I want to lead a church that plants churches. I'm in. I'm sold. That's, that's my life purpose. Like, I'm sitting in you know, your first class of seminary coming up with my life purpose kind of deal and, and sitting there. So I sat in this class next to a guy named Brett. And Brett and I were talking. You know, He's just barely married and I'm working on a marriage that's coming in a few months. And we both like to hunt. We both like to fish. We like to blow things up and chase golf balls. So we've got a lot of things in common. And so, you know, we're, we're just talking, and I'm like, what's your name again? It's Brett. Oh, yeah, I'm Chris. And so we're walking out of the class, and I'm walking next to Brett. Uh, you know, where do you live again? All oh, these apartments over here. So we're just chatting, and the professor literally runs out of the classroom after us. And so here's this, you know, North American Mission Board sponsor professor. So North American Mission Board pays his salary to teach at Southern to teach church planning. Um, and so he comes running down the hall after us, like trotting. And I'm like, okay, this is weird. And he's like, fellas, fellas, can I buy you lunch? And so I kind of looked at Brett. Brett looked at me. We're like, don't know you, don't know him. But yeah, sure, free food. We're in. Let's <laughs> look sweet. And so uh, we went and grabbed lunch with JD. And, you know, we're saying Dr. Payne. Dr. Payne's like, let me just drop the doctor stuff. Just call me JD. All right, um, so JD, and he's saying, where are you guys from? What do you do? And, you know, just kind of catching up with us. And they said, well, the reason I asked you to lunch is we need church planners in Canada. And Brett and I looked at each other and we're like, that's funny. <laughs> Never thought of that before. And I'm just now processing, like, I want to leave a church that plants churches. I just figured that out. Like, I'm still letting that resonate. And he's saying, we need church planners in Canada. And I'm going, you're nuts, man, but thanks for lunch. <laughs> And Brett's saying the same thing, like, we don't know each other, we don't know him, he doesn't know us, and he's just putting that in front of us. And so for the next two years, I actually worked on campus, started as a part-time student worker, that turned into a full-time job, and he would plop in my office for, for the next couple of years, like multiple times a week, he'd just walk in, sit down, so, Chris, when are we going to Canada? <laughs> he quit, man. Like, I'm not going to Canada. And my wife and I actually prayed about it. We said, okay, well, let's, let's think about it. And, and we prayed about it for a couple weeks, and just nothing. And we said, okay, well, that's, that's all right. Um, so uh, over the next few years, uh, I finished seminary and went to a church in northern Kentucky. I was there for a few years and moved to Lancaster in 2012, right, right at the beginning of the year. And uh, Brett ended up going to South Carolina to pastor a church there. So Brett and I stayed in contact, became fantastically good friends through seminary. Our wives hung out. Um, we both got four kids. Mine are just a shade older than his. I mean, Brett and I have been really close. Well, about three years ago, Brett went on a mission trip with his association to Calgary, to a church that was at the time about five, six years old. And they helped run a summer camp for kids. And he came back from that mission trip, walks in the door, and... and Brett's kind of like Peter, foot and mouth disease. Like He says things, and he's like, oh, I should have thought about that. He walks in the door, looks at Kristen, like who hasn't seen him in like seven days. He opens the door says, honey, we're moving to Calgary. <laughs> Kristen's like, uh, shut the door and try again. Um, just a hi, honey, how are you would be a good start. And, and so uh, they started a process that very quickly led them to Calgary to plant a church. So about two and a half years ago, they moved to Calgary. Uh, this summer, they celebrated one year of their church meeting publicly, um, and it just all these doors kept opening up uh, all the way to a place to meet in a city that's very expensive. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm talking with Brett through all these things, and like, man, that's exciting. And, you know, my daughter shot her first deer last fall, so I was calling Brett. He's one of the first people I sent a picture to, and like, man, Riley got one. You know, my seven-year-old knocked down a little tiny buck, but she got one. So we're, we're just, you know, we've always been in contact. And uh, so we said, okay, you know, Brett, that's awesome, man. We're so happy for you. We've been praying for you. We've been sending money to you. We've been thinking about taking a mission trip. You know, just, hey, we're supportive. We're friends. So uh, if you're familiar at all with World Changers, uh, Lifeway owns World Changers and P2 Missions. And what they do is they partner with the <coughs> in a city to do construction projects for students and uh, in the process share the gospel. So for two weeks every summer for the past few years, uh, I lead that in Cleveland. Um, so I'm the project coordinator, meaning we basically coordinate about five, 550 students coming 
and going out all over the city in like an hour radius from our central location. And it's just, it's a big organizational chaotic nightmare, but it's really awesome because we share the gospel over a thousand times in those two weeks, and we see a number of people come to the Lord, we're just, we're helping churches. Um, so my church frees me up to go do that, and so I went to the training last <coughs> night, so a year ago and a few months. I'm at this training in Birmingham, Alabama, Lifeway flies you down there, you get two days of this coordinator retreat, and then they fly you back. Sat next to a guy on the shuttle ride from Birmingham, uh, from, from Shaka Springs to Birmingham, it's about a 45 minute drive, sat next to this guy in the back of the bus. It's like I'm cramming this tiny little seat next to this guy that I've seen the past couple years at this coordinator retreat and never talked to. His name's Stan. And so Stan and I are just introducing ourselves. Hey, how you doing? I'm Chris. I'm Stan. And Stan says, hey, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a you know, pastor of youth and young adults at First Baptist Church in Lancaster. It's right outside Columbus. And uh, he's going, oh, I know where Ohio is. I'm going, what do you do? <laughs> and turns out he's the North American Mission Board Church Planning Catalyst for Alberta. So Edmonton and Calgary are two of the sin cities. So there's 32 sin cities that are the most lost cities in North America. Two of them are about three hours apart uh, with Calgary and then Alberta is three hours north. And he oversees church planting in those areas. So his job is to recruit and train and equip and resource and network church planters. So he's just, he's, he's in that ball, ball field. And so um, you know, so, oh man, that sounds really cool, you know, it sounds like it's a, a fun job, but very trying, and, you know, he said, I, I like to ask young guys in ministry this question, I'm like, thanks for calling me young, man, four kids and a bunch of gray hairs, I don't feel young anymore, but great, and he said, so, what, what, what does he want to do, like, what is it, you get, you got, what, 30-something years in front of you that are probably the most fruitful, best years of your ministry, where you've got enough experience to not make rookie mistakes, but you've got the energy to get it done. What is it you want to do? What is it you want to leave a legacy of? And I immediately went back to 2006 and said, I want to lead a church that plants churches. That's the trajectory of my life. I, that's what I want to do. And he said, oh, that's awesome. You ever planted a church before? I said, nope, just a youth pastor. That's as far as we've got. He said, uh, what do you think it would be hard to lead a church to plant churches if you've never planted one? He said, again, youth pastor, haven't gotten that far. He said, well, let me you know, just tell you what God's doing in Edmonton. So he started telling me. And, you know, he, here's a guy that was doing this. Here's a family that was doing this. And then they started working in the city, and they started doing these things. He's telling me these stories. I'm going, man, that's pretty cool. He said, uh, I also oversee some church planting activity in Calgary. And as soon as he said Calgary, uh, it was like gas being poured on a flame. Uh, so for six months before this, uh, my wife and I felt like God was moving our heart out of student ministry, out of college ministry, and, and we're not sure why, we're not sure where or how or when. Um, I sat down multiple times and tried to type up a resume because I had to touch the thing. I didn't even use a resume to come to Lancaster. They found me. And so I had to touch my resume since 2008. Um, it was really outdated. So I was like, well, I'm going to redo this thing. So I typed my name on the top of the paper, you know, like a resume should, and Six times I did that, and six times I said, okay, God, help me word this thing, structure it the right way, so it does what it's supposed to do. And six times God said, shh, you don't need it. Just shut the computer. So I did. And so I had no resume, had no idea what was going on, and, and so what we've been doing for a number of months, my wife and I, we said, okay, whatever God's doing, uh, we want to draw close to him, so we're going to double down, uh, we're going to double our time reading the Bible together, we're going to double the time we fast, and we're going to double the time we pray. So we're just going to like increase our spiritual disciplines times two, and go from there, and whatever God does, God does. And so we start praying, okay God, whatever you want, wherever you want, however you want it, that's fine. If I'm the youth pastor at First Baptist Church in Lancaster for the next 30 years, how we do it well. doesn't matter. I, I just want to be where you want me to be right in the center of what you want us to do. So, then he starts talking about Calgary in October. And I, I, it was gas on a flame, like a big flash of light, like, you know, the <clears throat> missiles going off, and I'm going, huh, what? <laughs> like, in this van, he's talking, and in my head, I'm going, whoa, 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 what? what are you, you're hitting me with a two-by-four, man. And so he started talking about Calgary. I said, hey, you know my friend Brett? You know, Brett's been there, you know, a year and a half now, and um, they just launched this summer. He's like, oh, yeah, I've been working with Brett to do this and this. And, yeah, Brett and Kristen are great. And so by then we got to the airport, and we're getting ready to part ways. And, you know, he's headed towards one way. I'm headed towards another. He's got an international flight back to Calgary, and I'm going just to Columbus. And so uh, we're parting ways at the airport. And he said, hey, do me a favor and just give your buddy Brett a call. 
was like, all right, call him three weeks ago. Tell him about my daughter's deer, but I'll call him again, sure. You know, it's, it's worth the dollar a minute to talk to a friend, sure, I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk to him. So uh, I got home Saturday, and I told my wife, just say, here's what I saw at the retreat, here's what it was, here's the different things for this year, just, you know, just a general report. I told her about a conversation with Stan. And, you know, he was talking about Calgary and said he'd give Brett a call. So, you know, I'll give Brett a call. And, um, but, you know, it just kind of felt a little weird. And so normally at night we read. Uh, and so I turned off my light, rolled over, and my wife was not reading. Uh, she was crying. Like the big gator tears, you know, like the, the real big, real big ones and silent. So, like, you know when your wife's crying, fellas, if you're married, if it's the silent cry, did something bad. Like, here you go. <laughs> so my first thought, I roll over, and my first thought, and I'm just I'm just tired, and I'm thinking, I've been gone for three days. What could I have possibly done this time? Like, I didn't do it. I came home with uh, the Swiss cake rolls. I stopped by the store and got a box of Swiss cake rolls on my way home. Like, you know, it's not really in the doghouse. If it's doghouse, it's recent cups. Preventative is Swiss cake rolls. So I came home with Swiss cake rolls and said, you know, honey, I missed you. I brought presents for the kids. Like, like man, I knocked this out of the park. I FaceTimed them when I was down there. Like, I'm good. I'm set. And I'm thinking, oh, I've messed up. What have I done? I forgot something. I'm running through my brain through the calendar. And, you know, all this checklist. I said, okay, what's going on? Because we have a rule. Um, after 10 p.m., we talk about nothing serious because it never ends well. Um, it just never ends well. Even if it's like a good comment, we just don't talk about anything serious after 10 p.m. It never ends well. So it's like 11.30. I mean, I'm, I'm going, okay, what's wrong? <laughs> like, I just stepped in and I might as well blow the bomb up. So um, she says, the way you were talking about Calgary, it's it's like we need to be there. And I said, no, 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 time out. Hey, no, 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 slow down. Uh, nobody has made up their mind about anything. I was just telling you about the conversation. She said, no, there's something there. And, and it's, I don't like it. I don't want to go. I don't even want to talk about it. But there's something there. You know, and we need to look at that. We need, we need to talk it out. I said, okay. So we prayed. And I'm going, you know. <laughs> I didn't do anything this time. Uh, so Monday, uh, two days later, I called Brett. Uh, you know, texted him on Sunday. said, hey, you free tomorrow? He to said, sure. So I called him. We caught up for a little bit. And, um, you know, I'm getting jealous because he's chasing moose and elk while I'm chasing deer. And, uh, you know, we, we talked. And then I said, yeah, I ran into this guy named Stan. He said, oh, I understand. Stan said I should talk to you. We we're talking about church planning. When he started talking about Calgary, there was something, something going on. Like, so you know, for six months we've been praying, fasting, reading scripture, and just saying, "Okay, God, whatever you want." He said, "Funny you should call." I was like, "Oh boy, where's this going?" He said, uh, "We've been partnering with a church in Oklahoma City, um, where Tom Elliff used to be the pastor before he went to the International Mission Board. So this is a big church. They went to Nam a couple years ago and said." Where do you need a church in Calgary? We feel led to help just kind of plow concrete, prepare the way for a church planning family to come start a church in the city. And so they put them with this mother church that was, you know, six years old that had planted Brett's church. Now you got two of them in the southeast part of the city. And they partnered with this church from Oklahoma in a community called Silverado to start doing mission trips, prayer walking, um, you know, just whatever we can do to help kind of plow the concrete where there are no churches and start something. He said, you know, we've been praying for about two weeks for God to send us a church planter because we feel like it's time to start the church and time to send a church planting family into this community. Um, we've done some preliminary work. There's a seat waiting on the community board, the homeowners association, if you will. Um, there's a seat waiting there for whoever that is. Um, you know, there's a little bit of funding already coming together. There's a plan. Um, we know what we're doing and how to do it. And so for two weeks we've been praying, and we agreed that we wouldn't advertise it. We'd just wait on God to send us somebody, and now you're calling me. <coughs> he said, okay, tell me more. So at a dollar a minute, we talked for like three and a half hours. Um, that was a big cell phone bill. Uh, but worth it. Uh, but worth it. And, uh, and we talked, and, and the conversation soon turned into what's it take to move there, what kind of pastor would succeed in, in that setting in the city. Um, you know, what experiences would point me towards church planting or no, and everything he's giving, like all the way down to the way I teach, I'm going check, 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 going, okay, God, uh, what's going on here? 
So I went home, told my wife, she said, well, what do we do next? I said, well, I think we're supposed to call North American Mission Board. We just told them we want to plant a church. <laughs> she said, okay. So uh, we prayed about it for a few weeks. And uh, at this point, we're nearing the end of October. And uh, so I called Nam. And this guy on the phone uh, said, well, tell me your story to this point. Start at the beginning. So I gave him everything up to that point. And he said, okay, um, you're going to tell that story a lot. So get used to it. I said, okay, no idea what he's talking about. Said, All right, sure. And uh, he said, well, the next step is to connect you with the Sin City coordinator, the Sin City missionary in Calgary. He's a guy named Bob Shelton. And you need, to, you need to touch base with him and talk with him. So hung up with this guy, called Bob. Bob calls back. He says, tell me your story. So he gave him the same story. And I'm like, all right, that's two. <laughs> so how many times are you going to tell this story? And, you know, now it's like thousands, but it feels like it. And so I uh, talked to Bob, and Bob said, all right, here's what I want you to do. You need to come up here with your wife on a vision trip. You need to walk around the city. You need to, to step off the plane and be on the ground for a few days and just get a vision for what God's doing in Calgary and see if it lines up with where he's leading you. You just, you just need to be here. So at this point, we're at the end of October. So I said, okay, well, uh, when are we going to do that? Because between Thanksgiving and then Christmas, uh, your, your church calendar is just like ours. It's crazy. Like, it's cramped. I mean, we got our budget meetings tonight. You know, on the 18th, it's our choir concert. I mean, it's, it's all kinds of stuff going on. And so um, I said, well, how about we take some time? Because I'm in no rush to move my family to another country a couple thousand miles away. And Bob said, that sounds great. Let's just slow down and let God do what he needs to do. So we said, okay, end of January, we'll come up. Um, and so Bob said, well, I want you to do, to do something a little different. I want you to fundraise your vision trip. I was like, okay, what does that entail? He said, if you can just get here, you need to get the plane tickets paid for. Um, if you get here on fundraising, that'll tell us two things. Uh, one, uh, do people believe in you enough to invest in you um, that they would even say this is possible? Uh, but two, it's going to tell us are you okay asking people for money because you're going to need it? I said, man, I'm, the only fundraising I've ever done is send in a letter to family and friends to go to Africa and Brazil on different mission trips. Like, I've never never had to fundraise my living. And, and so he said, well, that'll, that'll tell us, you know, you have it. So I said, okay, we'll do it. And so I went home, told Mindy. That was on a Friday that we chatted. On Sunday morning, I walked in, and on my desk at church was five $100 bills with a sticky note on top that said, uses the Lord leads, no strings attached. Still don't know who it's from. <laughs> Still no idea. So there's one plane ticket, done. Um, said, okay, got it. Um, I sent a, a couple messages online to a few friends um, just for the days gone by, and I sent seven of them. And I ended up with twice as much money as I needed to buy two plane tickets and go to Calgary. And just in seven messages, um, just just like that. I mean, it was literally just in a few days. The whole thing is funded, uh, times two. And I'm going, okay, um, got it, Lord. So I called Bob back, like on Wednesday. I said, hey, Bob, uh, we're funded, so I'll go ahead and buy the tickets. And he said, what? <laughs> uh, that was fast? I said, I just sent a few messages, man. People are generous, and God's good, and, and he, he speaks to people. And, you know, we're just we're, we're going along with the story he's writing. So we said, okay. Uh, so we went through January, and we did that for a few reasons. One was timing, but we also wanted to step off the plane in the middle of winter and say, can we handle a Canadian winter? We're winter people, all right? Ideal vacation is not the beach for us. Uh, my wife's a redhead. She just burns and, you know, blows the sun. Um, I don't like to sweat at all for any reason whatsoever. So, um, you know, we prefer cold weather. For it, uh, a quiet place to read is an ideal vacation where it's nice and chilly and I can grow up next to a fire and I'm happy. And so is my wife. So we're like, hey, we're always cold weather people. And so we stepped off the plane last January, kind of a mild winter, but still chilly and ice everywhere, um, some snow on the ground. And we said, man, this is beautiful. We love it. And as we walked around the city and as we heard from other church planners, as we talked with people, um, even Canadians who sat next to me on the plane kind of deal and just asking them questions and, and learning about Calgary and learning about Alberta and Canada in general. Um, I mean, it's just one piece of confirmation after another where God's saying, this is it, this is it, this is it, this is it. So the next step is North American Mission Board provides assessment. Uh, and by that, I mean um, a couple hundred dollars worth of personality, skill, marriage testing 
and then you sit down with this group of people for two 12-hour days in a row, and they just dive into every area of your life in depth. Like, they're asking my wife and I, when's the last time you fought? We're going, I don't know. When is the last time we fought? Well, why'd you fight over? I don't remember, do you? And she's going, yes. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you know like, and then they dig into our finances. Um, you know, Nam is very much aware of every penny uh, that I've spent in the last year and how much we owe and how much we've saved. And, I mean, they just, they dove in on every level. I was giving them giving statements from our church. I mean, they, they want to know, are you in? Are you serious? Are you a legitimate person? Um, they did background checks where they, you know, it's almost like an FBI deal where they call people that they then say, who else do you, you know, that knows this person? They're trying to go down the line. Um, I mean, it was just, it was intense. And they're, they're looking at, uh, what's my practice in evangelism? Who's the last person you led to the Lord? Uh, who's the last person you met with to develop them into a mature disciple? Um, I mean, they're digging in every aspect you could think of. They, they evaluated my preaching and my teaching. Uh, they evaluated my ability to write and communicate. I mean, they just, they dug in everything. And so we walked out of that in April. Uh, we went back to Calgary for this assessment retreat. And we went up there thinking, God, we think this is it. We're pretty sure it's it. Uh, matter of fact, we announced to our church about three weeks before we left that we were going to go to Calgary to plant a church, and we officially resigned. <laughs> and uh, and kind of put it at the mercy. We walked with our, from basically from the beginning on, from October when this kind of became a thing, uh, we sat down with our staff and our deacon and our personnel team, kind of our, our leadership structure, and, and said, hey, this is what we think is going on. Um, if I don't have the, the courage to tell you what God's doing, and stand in front of you, even if it doesn't work, and say, hey, I messed up, I was just trying to follow the Lord, I've got no business being one of your pastors, so um, we just we kind of walked through it with them, and so we said, hey, this is a good time to announce it, and they came to me and said, um, you know, what's the best way to help you prepare, and, and I said, man, I need to do the whole fundraising deal, and we'll get to that in a minute, and uh, you know, I, need, I need time to prepare and to, to move, and they said, well, would it help if we hired your replacement well before you left? I said, yeah, that would really help. Um, they said, would it help if we just kept paying you what we've been paying you until you leave in January? I said, yeah, <laughs> that would help. And so that's what they did. Um, actually, in, um, gosh, about three months ago, we hired the next youth and young adult pastor already. Um, so I've had a chance to pass everything off to him. Um, still show up at the office, but basically I spend my days trying to raise support and develop a prayer team and make plans to move. Um, so we uh, we went through the assessment and came back and it was just confirmation. It's meant to weed people out and we just took it as like a thumb stamp of approval. Like, this is it. Uh, we passed the assessment with flying colors. They said, hey, you've got all the experience and the tools we think would make a successful church planner in Calgary, Canada. Uh, we really want you to come. And so Nam said, we're on board, we endorse you, we're in. And we said, great, because we already resigned. Um, so we're coming anyways, because we have nowhere else to go. And, um, so it just worked. And, uh, and so we, we started from that point on, uh, kind of building a base of, hey, here's who we are, and here's where we're going. Um, so I've spoken in a number of churches, just kind of laying this out and saying, hey, God is doing something. And he's asked us to take part in that story, but we can't do it alone. So here's some of the numbers. Uh, I don't want to mess them up, so I brought paper. Um, some of the numbers that absolutely gripped us about Calgary and really confirmed for us what God was doing. Um, sometimes people ask us, where is Calgary? Uh, go to Yellowstone, and then go north about six hours, and you'll hit it. Uh, somewhere in that ballpark. So a little over 2,000 miles. Um, it's one of the fastest growing cities in North America. Would have never guessed that. Uh, Would have never guessed that in a million years. Um, I would say, well, like New York or L.A. is probably a fast-growing place. No, Calgary beats them by percentage. Um, so about 1.4 million people, and it's built on the oil industry. Uh, so you have uh, just a, a financial market. Uh, it's kind of the Wall Street of Canada that has sprung up because of all the oil fields in Alberta. So it's kind of like Texas. Um, anything that might support the oil industry is there. Um, so all the way from technology for drill tips that are drilling three miles down to uh, you know pilots flying people out to the oil fields and back. I mean, it's all just, that's what Calgary is, is built on oil. Uh, and outside of Calgary, around it, it's beef and nothing. Um, so crazy part is, 
Uh, we've been there a number of times now. You know, like I've been there five times this year, and the houses are quite literally there's gravel between. You can stand between the houses and touch them uh, because, and the driveways are tiny. Like I drive an F one fifty, and that is the length of the driveway. Um, the yards are tiny. Um, they're going spacious backyard. It's like four hundred square feet. We're going. Yeah, my daughter's going to hit the whiff ball over the fence every time. And, and but they have big green spaces that everybody plays in. So going okay. Um, and, and we're looking at this, going, how does this even work? Like uh, the houses are expensive. And we started looking at prices and what's it take to live there. And they said, uh, yeah, uh, uh, you know, cost of an acre in Calgary is a million dollars an acre. And we're going, are you insane? Like, you got to pick my jaw up off the floor. I, I'm starting to kind of get used to it. I don't think I'll ever be used to that idea that land is a million dollars an acre. I mean, that's insane. I grew up in the country. Um, land was not a million dollars an acre. Uh, a million dollars would buy you as many acres as you want kind of deal. And uh, so, you know, we, we started looking at all these numbers and trying to put them together. And we're like, There's no way this works. How does this make sense? And, um, you know, so, so we're looking at this going... Okay, God, uh, we see a lot of barriers here. Um, you've led us to this point. You got us through the assessment. Now that we're starting to look at, you know, the facts of living in another country, what is going on? Uh, how does this even work? And so, um, with it being a large city, it's growing. Um, we're saying, all right, uh, you called us here. You provide. So what do we do? And so I asked uh, the NAM people. I said, okay. You're going to have to explain this house thing to me um, because right now we live in a house. Uh, it's finally sell, sold, sell. It's sold. Um, well, it's in contract, and we'll, we'll close in the next few weeks, probably right before Christmas. And, um, you know, our house is 2,100 square feet. Uh, we got a decent backyard and a deck and a grill. I like my grill. So we're, we're saying, okay, um, you want us to move to another country to a house that might have 1,700 square feet with one less bedroom and pay how much? And they're going, yeah. Um, so just for example, uh, there's a house that um, it's like $436,000 and it's 1,700 square feet, three bedrooms. Um, and that's a cheap one. <laughs> we're going, you got to be kidding me. Um, so NAM uh, decided to get serious about investing and, and trying to get churches started. So what NAM did, and we just found this out like last week, which is just a huge like, uh, like breath of fresh air, they actually bought a house that we can live in rent free for up to two years, uh, which is just incredible, a uh, huge blessing. Uh, so we were looking at like about $2,000 a month in rent, and we don't have to pay that anymore. Um, so we are going, okay, well, that's fantastic. And they said, well, you still need to like fund it because you have to pay a down payment because you only got two years in this thing and you'll need a down payment for your house. So, um, you know, we're not out of the woods, but it does help us breathe a little bit and it's huge. Uh, but it also comes with responsibility that we would fill it with another church planter behind us. So we truly are a church that would plant churches because otherwise the name takes the house away. Um, the hand giveth, the hand taketh. And so, um, you know, we're, I'm going, okay, but that still doesn't make sense. How in the world... I, I, I'm a pastor. Like, I gave up the big salary idea a long time ago. Like, I don't make a lot of money. And we're okay with it. We're comfortable. And uh, they said, well, here's how you do the math. Because this is a big big question for us. Um, four kids, and we're going, okay, uh, what do we do? Um, they said, your tax rate is about the same, and your salary number will be about the same as it probably is there. It's just your taxes are done differently. So, and I said, but how do you pay a $2,000 a month house payment? Like, how does that even make sense in any world? And they said, okay, all the money that the church pays on your behalf for health care, so your health insurance, plus what you would pay for co-pays and co-insurance as you get medical bills, if you took that number that you would average, plus what you already spend on a house out of your salary, and put those together, you could probably do it. And I'm going, yeah, I could. They said, there you go. That's how it's done. And I was going, Okay, so don't pay for health care. Got it. Uh, what do my tax dollars do? Then? I said, well, you know, it doesn't pay for that huge of a military. Um, found this out a little while ago. About 80% of Canadians live in a city, and 80% of Canadians live within three hours of the border to the U.S. So they just kind of rely on the U.S. might and muscle. 
um, that probably many of your family members, maybe even some of you, just like mine, uh, have served and, and given their lives for even. And they just rely on that. So they don't really pay for a huge military. So the taxes are right, right, you know, what they are, where you are now, like any other city. And I'm going, all right. So that's how it's done, right? And they're going, yeah, I'm going, so there's more money coming into the account, but there's more money going out, so it's about the same. They said, yeah, plus about 30% living cost adjustment compared to, you know, like a major U.S. city. I said, all right, so we can do this. There's, there's, it's feasible. We can, we can make this work. And they're going, yes, it's, it's possible. Um, so we started putting together a plan, and um, all throughout it, um, the thing we go back to is 5%. Um, Calgary's got 1.4 million people and growing at a pretty astronomical rate and 5% of the population claims to follow Christ at all. Only about half of that even go to church, ever. So you have like 2% of the population, maybe, that goes to any church on a regular basis. That, there's nothing. Uh, we're looking at an area called Silverado. And Silverado has no known Bible study in it. There's no church even trying to reach it. We've identified two families that go to churches in other communities. That's it. Like, there's nothing. It's this black hole. And uh, so one of the things we started looking at, all right, last, last cool story. Um, one of the things we started looking at uh, when we started praying about Calgary and how do we get there, what do we do, started looking at the church plants in Calgary and saying, what, what is it? So um, I did an MDiv, and then I went straight into a doctorate program in evangelism and church growth. Uh, so all my training for the last five years has been, how do we help churches grow by reaching people? Uh, what are the barriers that would prevent that? How do you identify those barriers and overcome them? What do you do? How do you do it? Um, so very practical, which is why I did it. I wanted to serve the church as best I could. And so I started looking at things from that lens and saying, okay, God, uh, what's going on here? I started talking to church planters. Uh, they plant inside communities, usually in a community center or in a home, and they hit about 60 people on a Sunday, and then they hit their head on the ceiling, and they can't get past them. Um, and I'm saying, okay, what are, why, why, why is that happening? Why are we not growing? Because at 60, you can kind of self-sustain financially, but you can't really multiply into more churches. And if I'm going to move my family 2,000-something miles away, we're going to plant a church and plant churches. And I'm not going to take a breath until we start planting other churches. That's the win. Uh, we want to bring people in to send them out. How do we do that? There's enough people there. There's enough lostness there. There's literally no competition. So how do we do it? And, and so I started looking at things and breaking it down. And, and we landed on two things that really stood out um, that – Really, probably the reason North American Mission Board bought a house and believes in the plan um, boiled down to these two, re two reasons. Uh, the first one is churches in, in Calgary and really in Canada, um, these communities are very sequestered. So you've got highways and, and waterways and things that break communities apart. So it's like uh, if I live in Silverado, even though I can see Somerset and I drive past it every day, I never go to Somerset because in Silverado I have my grocery store, my doctor, my dance studio for my kids, Dairy Queen, Starbucks. I mean, it's all right there in Silverado. So apart from like a big department store, I don't shop outside of Silverado. I don't go to Somerset to play sports with my kids. I don't go to the park in Somerset. I go to the park in Silverado. And people don't cross those lines. So churches that plant specifically in a community, they don't really do a good job of reaching people in the communities around them, even though literally you can see them. They just don't cross that line. So I said, okay, so we need to think regional. How do we do that? Started looking at some things. And the second thing I saw that was preventing churches from really multiplying and starting a movement within the city, they don't start with a team. If you got one guy or one family trying to do it all themselves, and you can't. You just cannot do that by yourself. It's not hot. There's not enough hours in a day, nor enough capacity in a person to go and do what needs to be done to multiply. So it takes them forever to get off the ground. It takes them forever to start multiplying, if ever. So I said, okay, well, if we started with a team, and we had a staff team from day one, and we started looking at things regionally and not specific to a community, then what does that mean? And they said, oh, nobody in Canada is doing that. 
except one other person. Um, so you need to talk to them. I'm going, all right. Uh, so we started investigating this and, and what, what it is, and, and this is just God's design. If you can imagine a horseshoe, like here, here's Silverado. It's in the southern, dead south of the city. It is the last neighborhood before you get to nothing. Like three hours in every direction is nothing around Calgary, and they're worried about urban sprawl. Um, and there's just nothing. It's flat. There's nothing. And, you know, you've got the Rockies right here and nothing. Um, so, but right around Silverado, there's a couple communities here, and there's a couple communities here that kind of make a horseshoe. Right in the middle of that horseshoe is an area called Shaughnessy. Shaughnessy is where you go for Home Depot and Lowe's and Sam's Club and Costco and all your restaurants. So all the things that aren't neighborhood specific, but they're regional. There's a YMCA there. There's a couple schools there. And I said, okay, is anybody doing anything in any of these communities? Is there any church even active in these communities? Is there a church even trying to reach these communities? Is there even a Bible study that anybody knows of anywhere in these five communities? No, 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 no. Nothing. It is a black hole of Christian activity. I said, okay. Well, they got a central area called Shaughnessy. So if we met at the YMCA, for example, and rented a room there on Sunday mornings or evenings or whatever we got to do, then I wouldn't have to give directions. I wouldn't need road signs. I would just say we meet at the Y at Shaughnessy. And everybody in those communities knows where it is. It's a normal drive. There's no barrier of I never go there. Piece of cake, right? So we can do this. And they're going, yeah, that would work. I said, so if we start with the team and we're active in multiple communities at once, and our Bible studies are in communities, but our worship gatherings are central and regional, then, then we can start a church that will multiply. And Nan's going, yes, go talk to that one other guy that's doing it. So just so happens, uh, his name is Dan Suezo. He and his wife Amber, they've got a couple people on their team they started with. They're about a year ahead of us on their timeline. They launched publicly, so they've been there for a year. And then they launched their first service on September 11th. Their first opening day had 186 people or something like that. And they, they launched with a large group that came. They're active in four different communities. They're meeting in a movie theater at the mall where they don't have to draw a map. They just say, hey, we're meeting at the, you know, the Stony Brook Theater. And everybody knows where that is. It's a normal drive. And they've been able to maintain. I mean, they float right around 100 now. Um, but growing every week. They've led a number of people to the Lord. They've been able to celebrate baptisms. They're sharing stories of life change. They've got a, a team in place. They've got a leadership team now. Things are, are, are humming. They're growing. And they're already looking at how do we start another church. They're already asking that question. So they, they've been in existence for less than a few months. And they're already saying, hey, how do we, how do we send people out? How do we multiply? So it is possible. And literally, this is a foreign concept to all of Canada. Like, Canada is not doing this. So NAM is looking at them, and they're looking at us and saying, if this works, that's how we're going to plant, ch plant churches in Canada from here on out. Like, that's the new planting strategy, because it works. So Dan and Amber, they did it, and NAM said, you're either an outlier or you're the new model. So they're looking at Chris and Mindy saying, you're either going to confirm that this works or it's a, it's a scratch. And said, okay, well, let's do it. Um, so Nam's very interested in what we're doing, um, but uh, because of Canadian law, um, I go in on a clergy visa. There's a church there that's sponsoring us, Brett's Church, my buddy. Um, they sponsor our visa, uh, but because of that, I can't work outside of the church that brings me. So until I can get what they call permanent residency, which is like the middle step between citizen and visa temporary worker, there's permanent resident, it takes a few years. Until then, I can't work outside the church. Otherwise, I would. I'd be happy to work in the secular workplace and meet more people and, and kind of provide support on that level. So essentially what's happening at this point is we've been going around talking with churches, talking with individuals as much as we can to try and build a financial runway. It takes about four years, they say, for a church in Canada to become financially sustainable. Um, we think we can do it faster than that if the Lord provides it and he keeps doing stuff that he's been doing. Um, but we don't know, and so that's kind of our target is four years, and at this point, uh, right now, we're about 65% funded uh, from what our goals are. Uh, so what that means, very practically, we have enough money raised to get us there. Uh, we have enough money coming in starting in January to keep us there, uh, but we're still raising support to launch with the team and to have that budget to launch the right ministries. Um, so. Uh, that's kind of where things are in a nutshell. I know I didn't leave a ton of room for questions. But if you guys got questions, um, 
I could talk about this a lot, but I just try to hit the high points. That's where things are, um, and the biggest thing we're asking for is for people to pray for us. Um, without people praying, this is this is pointless. Um, we need to pray for conversations that are going to take place. Um, we're trusting that God is already preparing hearts to hear the gospel. Um, we're, we're sharing the gospel with people that it's not uncommon to meet somebody my age in their mid thirties uh, who has never had a Bible in their home. Uh, who has never heard the gospel, never been invited to a church service, never been invited to a Bible study, that is, that's, a, that's a normal story. So they're about a generation ahead of the U.S. as far as kind of the moral decline, if you will. And so uh, just going into a, a socialist government with a liberal thought process, and, you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty conservative Ohio boy, so... Um, we're going into an area that's, that's tough to reach, um, and, and many people will say it can't be done. Uh, there's actually a guy that told Dan and Amber uh, that, hey, what you're doing doesn't work, and it won't work, because nobody else had ever done it. And, uh, and Dan stuck to what God had called him to. And so as we laid out this plan, and they introduced us to Dan and Amber, and, uh, and we've seen, we've been able to learn from what they've done uh, to this point, so hopefully we launch even stronger and better. Um, but the win for us uh, is to plant a church and plant churches. I could care less how big our church is. I could care less if anyone even knows my name outside of people I've talked to. I don't care. Uh, what I do care about is playing kingdom ball. I, I want to advance the ball down the field. Um, because Jesus is coming back. Our, our days are numbered. And I want to live with a sense of urgency and take as many people to heaven with me as I can. Um, so that's our heartbeat. Um, you know, if you got any questions, you can fire them out. Um, I brought a little bit of stuff. If you would be so inclined um, after we're done, this is a little prayer card. Um, so cool thing about First Baptist Church Lancaster, uh, a number of people have supported us in a bunch of creative ways. Uh, one of them, uh, there's a guy in our church, he's dying of cancer and uh, just took a turn for the worst yesterday. Just had surgery to try and keep his kidneys functioning. Um, it's not looking good. Uh, he's done two things, uh, which have been incredible. He gave me a blank check, and he said, print what you need to. I was like, Rick, you know how much this costs, right? And he said, oh, no, don't worry about it. Like, just print whatever you need, and just tell me what the number is. Uh, so we went with the Minuteman Press, and we made, like, a prospectus that's got all kinds of stuff about us. We, uh, we did these prayer cards um, that you can hang on your fridge and, or, or, you know, put somewhere where you'd see it and pray for us often and regularly. Um, and so if you want one of those, I've got those. Uh, but then Rick did something else uh, about three months ago. Uh, he poked his head in the church office on a, on a Wednesday afternoon and said, uh, Chris, I need your Social Security number. He said, Rick, I love you. I appreciate you. I trust you. But why in the world do you need my Social Security number? He said, well, I figure I'm not going to be around long enough to go to Calgary to see this thing in person, but I still want to have an impact, so I'm going to write it in the will. And a percentage of what I have is going to you. I said, wow. Um, which is incredible. Um, and, and there's all these stories that God is just, he's raising people up. There's a guy at Bloom Baptist where, where Mike is the pastor. Um, he, he does a Santa Claus thing and tells the story of St. Nicholas and shares the gospel with people. Um, but normally he gets paid for it. He charges 50 bucks an hour. Um, he's giving us the 50 bucks an hour that he makes being Santa. Um, so, uh, you know, God's raising people up, and if he would do that with you, uh, I promise you we would be accountable. Um, I'll send regular updates. We do that already. We started with that, but uh, our, our strategy to communicate, um, you know, we'll be back at least once a year to visit and say, hey, here's what God's doing. Here's how it's going. Um, but once a quarter, so every three months, um, we're going to be putting out, here's how many times we've shared the gospel. Here's who we've led to the Lord. Here's a story of what God's doing. Here's how things are going. Uh, we've got a monthly newsletter. Um, so on all this, you'll see our website. It's followtheflores.com. If you go there, there's a partner tab. You just click on the partner tab. And if you hit prayer partner, you just type in your name and email and location so that way it knows you're not a robot. And uh, and you'll get our monthly newsletter through that way. And there's also a financial partner. And then if you want to bring a mission team, uh, which would be incredible. And if you guys want to send a team of people up to Calgary and love on people that have never heard the gospel, uh, where 25% of the population is from another country, um, you can quite literally impact the nations in Calgary.
can be a huge blessing to us and help us get the ball down the field even faster. Um, so, all that to say, uh, thanks for your time this morning. I appreciate it. And uh, if you don't mind, you can pray for us and we'll get a little break from this service. Father, thank you for uh, how you call us and thank you for uh, how you provide. We got here. Your design is so much greater than ours. And uh, Father, we trust you. We trust you enough with our eternity. And so I ask that you would help me and, and help everyone here to trust you with our today as well. So God, we ask you to do what you do best, which is speak to us, that we would hear with open hearts that are willing to be molded. Uh, God, invade our lives so that as you would speak and as you would lead, we would follow where we fight against your leading, I pray that you would help us to oh, allow you to fight for us. Your word's clear. We need only to stand still and let you God. So God, I pray that you would speak to us clearly, whether it's a conversation that needs to happen with a friend or a family member, uh, maybe an issue of forgiveness, uh, whatever it is that you're calling us to be obedient to in our lives today, I pray that we wouldn't delay that we would live with a sense of urgency in following your will, uh, not because some outside force is, is imposing on us, but rather because we love you and we're grateful for what you've done for us through Jesus on the cross and in bringing him back from the dead. Uh, thank you for conquering the grave and giving us that life. And Father, we pray for the next hour that if there are any here that don't know that truth or have drifted from it, are standing confidently in who they are in Christ, that that would change today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you want, uh